Um, good morning, everyone. Or actually, good afternoon. Sorry, still a little bit jet lag there. Um, thanks a lot for making it to this session. I know it's at the very end of the very last day, and uh, everybody's pro if you're like me, you're probably getting tired as well. Um, so thanks a lot for making it to, to this session. I hope everybody had a good time at the OpenStack Summit. Um, so uh, right now, I'd like to talk about uh, what it takes to make an application cloud aware um, and uh, use some of the experience that we've had um, building applications for our customers, uh, building applications for ourselves, uh, to illustrate what that w means and what, how we can leverage different tools to be able to build uh, such uh, cloud-aware applications. So uh, first of all, a little bit about myself. My name is Sebastian. Uh, I'm the founder of the uh, Scalar Open Source Project, which is a cloud management platform, a CMP, uh, specifically built for the enterprise to be able to uh, to create and uh, enforce the controls for IT to be happy and still enable DevOps to be um, productive. So my colleague Thomas is here with me. Hello. Hi. Um, and uh, he built the CloudBench library that we'll, uh, we'll be talking about in just a moment. All right, so uh, what I, I'd like to start out with a story, uh, the story of CloudBench, which is an open source project, um, and use the, the process and how we built this application to illustrate the uh, problems we ran into. And, um, and we've got a blinking screen right there. Strange. All right, so it all this <laughs> this whole thing has started with a few a uh, few benchmarks back in uh, I think it was back in February of 2000 uh, of this year 2013, uh, where we had some customers that were asking us um, whether Google Compute Engine <coughs> sorry uh, whether Google Compute Engine was actually much faster than uh, Amazon or whether they were on par or or uh, what cloud they should choose based on. Uh, based on pure performance uh, criteria. And we didn't really know what to answer. So uh, uh, as a good scientist would do, we went out and started benchmarking things. Uh, so what we did is a series of uh, fairly, fairly short benchmarks uh, to um, compare instance uh, in, in instantiation times, uh, the speed of the storage systems like EBS or uh, Google Compute Engine's persistent disks, and, um, and we, we ran all those benchmarks and we published a paper uh, that we submitted to GigaOM that got many, many hits, tons of comments. And, uh, and the overall conclusion, if we can read it when it's not blinking, is that the, can you, hit, can you go back? Is that the Google Compute Engine isn't just fast, it was Google fast. And of course, Google loved that quote and has been using it in a lot of their sales materials. Uh, but if there was one person that wasn't very happy about this, it's Amazon themselves, as, as you can imagine. Uh, in many of the tests, we saw a five to one ratio of, uh, of uh, improvements uh, that Google had over, over Amazon. And so every time you, I, I'm sure if you've ever done benchmarks in your life, uh, every time you publish one, there's always some guy out there that's going to criticize your methodology. Hey, you didn't run it on enough tests. I don't. I can't reproduce these results. Um, why isn't this thing? Uh, why aren't the actual numbers uh, open? Why are you just uh, sharing a summary of all of this? So we had a fair amount of criticism. A lot of people that were encouraged uh, to do their own benchmarks. Uh, but again, Amazon by far was the uh, most upset by these results. So we set out to actually professionalize our benchmarks. Uh, and to make, uh, make a, um, uh, a, a benchmarking tool that would allow you to test the performance of your cloud um, and allow the community to run that tool, uh, those benchmarks themselves, to be able to assess independently, based on their workload, uh, what cloud they should be choosing for performance reasons alone. So we built a disk benchmarking library called CloudBench uh, that does a couple things. Um, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, but mostly, it's, there's a client, there's a server. Um, and in the process, it, it provisions all the resources you need. It runs a lots of tests. And it re reports all those uh, on, on a centralized service. Uh, this was open sourced a couple months ago. Is that correct, uh, mm, yeah, yes. uh, Thomas? Um, and you can find it on github.com slash scalar slash cloudbench. Um, all right. So uh, let me talk a little bit about what we understand as a cloud-aware application. Uh, a cloud-aware application is an application that leverages the integration uh, of, uh, that integrates with the cloud platform it's running on. 
Um, and in our case, we were using that for configuration purposes. What that means is uh, when we were deploying a benchmark in a particular environment, say on Amazon or on Google, it would have to automatically discover where it was running. And based on where it was running, it would have to provision a certain amount of volumes, a certain amount of capacity, um, and all the, the parameters that you're running your benchmark on and that you're running your test on. So what it needs, it needs, when it initializes, it needs to identify the platform it's running, such as location, instance type, um, whole thing, a whole bunch of things like that. And then it uses all that data to be able to report, um, aggregate, and, uh, and send that to a reporting platform. Uh, but there's actually a lot of different um, use cases for cloud-aware applications, not, not just that. Um, any autonomous bootstrapping process, like if you're building an application that you want to be portable, an application you want to be able to move from one cloud to another, or if you're interested in cloud bursting, if you're interested in uh, hybrid clouds, then having applications that are aware of where they're being deployed will help you achieve that portability. Uh, so uh, some examples is when your application needs to hit the user data APIs, the metadata APIs, uh, to be able to understand that configuration data. Um, and in, in some, some cases, you may need to hit the actual cloud APIs for some, some, actual, some data that's not available through the metadata servers. Now, this can be really, really challenging. Like if you're running this on a single cloud, like if you're just benchmarking OpenStack, um, you can probably do it with greater ease than if you want to actually achieve true benchmark across multiple different clouds. And if you think about it, uh, OpenStack, CloudStack, EC2, Google, Google Compute Engine, even Rackspace, which ha has an API that's slightly different from, from OpenStack, each of them have different, sometimes often inconsistent responses uh, that just make it very hard to, to build um, such a system. So we kind of identified two ways of building these cloud-aware systems. Uh, obviously, there's the cloud-native way, um, and then there's a, another way that abstracts uh, some, of those, some of those differences. But let, let's talk about the native way first. Um, the native way is to write different code for every cloud that you're deploying on. And that's kind of like if when you're doing mobile development, you're going to want to build an iOS application, an Android application, and you're going to have very little uh, in common between the two platforms. So you're going to have to write a lot of code, uh, maintain that code uh, separately, um, and um, that's a fair amount of work. Um, that code, when, once, it, once your application initializes, it needs to identify where it's running on. So it needs to hit the metadata server. Uh, metadata server. Uh, it needs to hit the, uh, your cloud's APIs to be able to get all that. Um, and also you need to distinguish just the right, what sort of code are, do you need to um, execute to begin with. Um, if you're going to be uh, deploying on uh, EC2 and your application uses the wrong block of code the wrong, uh, and makes all the, uh, the calls thinking that it's on OpenStack, um, they're going to be in a world of pain. So that's what CloudBench does. And Thomas, if you want to elaborate a little bit about the, on the native way. Um, yeah, so the general idea is that we want the application to hit the APIs and realize which cloud it's running on. So it's going to try the metadata APIs for multiple clouds and from there conclude, oh, well, if, I, if I'm able to talk to the OpenStack API, I'm probably running on OpenStack. And at that point, then it's going to call the actual OpenStack APIs to then figure out, well, what kind of volumes are attached to me because it's a disk benchmarking library. So that library is going to ask basically the OpenStack API hey, can you tell me what volumes are attached to me, where they're attached, what's their size? Then it's going to run the benchmarks on those, and then it will report those results. It's going to report those to the server, to the reporting server, and tell, well, I was running with two disks, and those are my results. And so this is what it looks like. Um, at a high level, the, the logic is the same across, the, uh, across all the clouds, but the implementation is actually very different. Thomas? Yeah, so that's the general logic. So Again, it's just a snippet. The goal isn't for you to, to work off of this or anything. But the <laughs> idea is that we have the, we've got the same logic that's going to be, oh, well, I'm going to ask my cloud what are the attachments. I'm going to ask it if my volumes are persistent. But of course, the attachments, the format is going to depend, depend on the cloud itself. 
And then we're going to follow the same logic and check every volume, check if that volume is acceptable. That's basically just about checking the volumes actually attached if we don't get it, didn't get an error. And also if for security reasons we didn't tell the library, hey, please don't benchmark this one because we know it's the local volume, so no way you're going to benchmark this one. And then it's going to actually run the benchmarks. It's going to check the file names and then we'll just move on. And so this logic will be the same. But the actual implementation is going to be different. Because if you check there, we had that, like, that cloud.attachments method. So it's like, that looks simple, but actually it's not. Because all each cloud is going to have its own logic. So this one's going to be Rackspace, and Rackspace will use Rackspace's library to connect. But of course, if you're going to connect to GCE, well, then we use GCE's library to connect. And that means that eventually, we need to have all these blocks of code, one per cloud that we want to use. And the problem is, well, figuring out which platform you're using isn't actually going to be that easy. And the thing is, so what we did, maybe there's another way, that's the one we chose is, we just try to hit the various metadata servers and see if they're responding. Now the problem we had is, well, this, like EC2 was the first, so there's lots of compatibility APIs. And if you're on OpenStack and you actually hit the metadata API, it might actually be compatible. Same thing on CloudStack. An example, uh, an example of that is if you're running on, say, cloud scaling, where they, uh, they pride themselves in having uh, fully compatible EC2 APIs, that means that if you, you, know, you take your cloud-aware application and you put it on cloud scaling's distribution of OpenStack, uh, you might test um, that you're, and, and ask your environment if you're in EC2, and it actually responds that you are, but you're not. Yeah, and that's going to bring all sorts of issues because then in your benchmark, this record's going to show up on EC2, but you weren't on EC2, so that's not what you want. And the thing is, afterwards, you're going to call the APIs, and the calling conventions aren't going to be correct, and you'll actually crash the whole thing. So there are problems we had to face. And then there's worse than this. Sometimes there are actually no metadata API. If you're using Rackspace, you actually have to call that Xen thing that's going to tell you. You can't hit the actual API itself. You have to hit the local agent, which is going to give you the same answer, but that means that you have yet another branch of code to handle that specific corner case. And so it's going to look like this. Again, the logic looks simple, but you've got that thing is present that you have to implement for every single cloud that you intend to support. So um, to, to summarize this, um, the, that, that was uh, when building a Cloudware application, uh, building it the, the native way has some advantages, some disadvantages. Uh, the, the pros here are, are obvious. You have a lot more control. Uh, you can do exactly what you want. Um, and no external tooling is required. Now, the, so actually, yeah, and there's one last thing that I probably, we probably meant, forgot to mention. Um, there also just the fact that if you're going to build that application, that's probably the first thing that's going to come to mind. You'll probably be, oh, well, I'll just implement one thing for every cloud. And it's going to look very easy. Then we'll find out it's not necessarily that case. Yeah, kind of like when you're building an application and your requirements change and yeah. you then need to re-architect things. Um, <clears throat> and then the, uh, there's a lot of uh, disadvantages to building uh, cloud-aware applications using uh, native, the native APIs. Um, like we just talked about, it's, <clears throat> sorry, uh, like we, what we just talked about, it's actually not easy at all to figure out what platform you're running on uh, because of the, uh, the, these EC2 and uh, compatibility that you have. Um, <clears throat> so that, that leads into a lot of complexity, a lot of testing that you need to do, and a lot of uh, extra code that you have to write and maintain and troubleshoot. Um, do you want to elaborate on yeah. that? So, and so as Sebastian was saying, that means more code. And the thing is, at that point, what we thought is, we just figured, well, we might as well use one of the, for example, libcloud libraries. And we'll just use that. And that will just abstract away all these clouds, so we'll just call the first API we find, and it's just going to work. Uh, now, there's a few problems with that. The first one is, you are, even if you use one library that does everything, you still need to figure out which cloud you're running on, if only to find the actual host name for the API. So that problem isn't solved. And the other problem, which, is, which isn't solved either, is these are usually restricted to shared functionality across clouds. And there might be cases where we want to benchmark a few things that are very specific. For example, we get Rackspace. We run our benchmarks for a specific set of volumes. And we want to compare that with, say, EC2. But then EC2 is going to come to us and tell us, 
hey, you didn't benchmark EBS optimized instances, so you must be hiding something. That means that we have to be able to, from one instance, identify if it's EBS optimized. And these multi cloud libraries may not always give all these pieces of information that we need, um, which is why we ended up having to basically have one implementation per cloud and not one that uses that shared library. Um, and, and finally, uh, there's the obvious problem of ma having to manage the, the credentials that you have across all the different clouds. And um, of course, we did this in a sandbox test environment, so it was pretty easy for us to include the keys and all the credentials uh, in all our environments. But if you're, if you're going to be building a, a production-ready applications uh, that are portable across multiple clouds, then key management becomes quite an issue. Uh, and, and that's something that we didn't have to touch upon with, with CloudBench. Uh, but for production workloads, that's something that you, you very much have to care about uh, and, and manage. Uh, you don't want to be packaging every single server with every single key that you have. And so the conclusion of doing this the native way is that it was just not very scalable from a developer perspective, from the amount of time that we were doing. Um, and every additional cloud that we were adding uh, took more time than the, the previous one and uh, was just generally very painful. So it's not scalable based on the number of clouds and number of platforms that you're running on. And it wasn't scalable to the number of applications you have. We just wrote CloudBench. But if we were to build lots of hybrid cloud or cloud bursting uh, applications, then we would have to re-implement this every single time, and there'd be, uh, there'd be a lot of wasted time and effort right there. Um, so we kind of thought about, like, what if we could delegate the responsibility on building that, that multi-cloud abstraction to another, uh, to another layer? Thomas? Yeah, so our objective there was we figured there's still some bits of logic. So remember I said that there are some pieces where well, one common library isn't going to cut it because you need to identify very specific ports. But if you look at the entire thing that CloudBench does, it starts by provisioning those volumes, and then it also is going to make the reports. What we figured we could do is take at least one part of this, the volume provisioning, and delegate that to another code base, which is what we did, and delegated this to another app. Well, of course, the reason being, well, we had a company working on that app, so we were interested in using it. But now let's look what it looks like. Um, and so um, when, when leveraging our, our own tooling to build this and our own multi-cloud abstraction, <clears throat> it made it much easier to, uh, to come up with the uh, primitives to get this to happen. And this is what it looked like in the interface. Um, what you have here is you have a certain amount of storage that you've, you've defined at, um, at uh, prior at design time, prior to, uh, to run time. Um, and you, what you can see here, on the, on, or probably can't see on the left, is that we decided that on this particular instance, regardless of what cloud it's running on, it's going to have two volumes running uh, with the, the XT3 file system with uh, 100 gigabytes of persistent disk. Um, and um, uh, and they're, they're both going to be uh, uh, attached to, uh, to the device automatically. So, and the idea with that was there, and that, by the way, this app is actually Scala. It's built by the uh, three good folks right there in the back. <laughs> and the idea that what we'll only look at and what they actually built is they built this app that we can use to take those common pieces of functionality and abstract them so that actually when our server starts running, when our app starts running, well, the volume's already there. So we don't actually have to take care of how do I actually attach those volumes. And what they also did is, you still get the option that if you're running on a specific cloud, you'll actually get extra options. So in this case, we could get for EBS, we could get a PyOps volume, although there's no equivalent on another platform. But of course, and we'll see later, this isn't the ultimate solution for all cases, and we'll conclude by saying, like, when should you use each of those? But before we do that, uh, let's look at the pros of doing it that way. Yep, so um, w when you're doing that with a multi-cloud abstraction layer, um, there's a lot more code that you can reuse across the different applications that you're, that you're, uh, you're deploying. So remember when we said that uh, building it the native way wasn't scalable to the number of clouds and the number of applications? Um, having this layer in between your, the cloud and your application allows you to reuse a lot more code and, and just uh, overall be more productive. Uh, you also have a single code base 
to manage all your de all uh, all those libraries and all of those deployments. So uh, it reduces the amount of uh, of efforts and, and errors you can have. And finally, uh, when you have to write tests for all this, um, as a corollary of having a lot of less test cases, uh, less uh, ifs and and parameters, you also have to write a lot less tests. Yeah, and if I could touch a bit on this. Um, the idea is that we actually both had to write the tests once on the, uh, so on the, we did two ways, as you guys mentioned. There's the one where we actually run the benchmarks and the one where we provision the volumes. Mm -hmm. And the big difference is, if you do everything the native way, what you end up doing is that you have to multiply every different logic that you have by every different cloud that you use. Whereas if you actually do it that way, the key advantage is that these guys will only have to write their tests against every cloud they use. And then you have to write your tests, your logic, and test it just against their API. So that you don't end up multiplying, you just have to sum both integrations. And that makes it more scalable when you actually have to implement that for multiple apps and multiple platforms. But there's still cons and Sebastian. Um, and the obvious, uh, the obvious disadvantage here is you actually need that layer. Um, so depending on the size of your company, you can either decide to build that layer yourself, and the amount of resources you want to put into building that layer yourself is a function of how many clouds you want to uh, deploy on, how many applications you want to be portable across those clouds. Um, and so there's the classic build versus buy uh, decision you have. Um, but but uh, in our case, um, Scalar being open source, it's a good candidate for being used given that uh, there's, there's not that cost associated with it. Um, so what we're trying to say here is that when you're building applications that, uh, that you want to be able to cloudburst, uh, applications that are going to span across multiple environments, multiple clouds, uh, in, in, for example, private cloud scenarios, um, you're probably going to prefer writing it uh, using the native APIs if you're going to use a single cloud, single application, meaning if it's a, if it's a one-off. But if, you're, if you're, this is an, a, an enterprise co corporate-wide initiative to increase portability of your applications, um, then you probably want to have a dedicated layer for, uh, for cloud abstraction and for, uh, for in facilitating uh, building these cloud-aware applications. If you, if, you, if you think about it, the real thing we're trying to say here is if you're going to do a very small thing on your laptop, you might try to bash script for it because it's just the fastest way to do it. But as soon as your project is going to grow bigger, you want to project to run more machines, well, then bash scripts very quickly become less efficient. And that's why we get all these things like Chef, for example, where you just tell Chef, hey, this is what I want to be doing, and Chef is going to be doing it, whatever the platform is, whatever the specific integrations are. And what we're trying to say is, well, the same thing exists for cloud, and having tried both ways, well, the chef cloudish way is actually the one that worked the best for us. Using this abstraction tool scale out we, talk, we showed just a bit before. Um, yeah, so that's some of the takeaways. Um, that when, when you're building these, uh, that, that generally, if uh, you're going to be building a lot of applications over a lot of clouds, uh, the scalable way is to have that, uh, that middleware, that middle tier in between your cloud and your application to facilitate the building of these. Um, and um, tell us. Okay. Um, and uh, so that's the first thing. But if you're going to be building a single application on a single cloud, then of course uh, the native is just faster. Kind of the, what, uh, like Thomas was talking about with uh, writing a bash script is, is, is fast. But if you're going to be building a large application, it just doesn't scale as well. So can I get a quick show of hands of he, who here is uh, planning to build like a, um, a hybrid cloud, an application that's going to span two clouds or cloud bursting? About 20% of you, something like that. Uh, any questions? Does, is this relevant? Does this help you? Uh, does this resonate with your experience in building these uh, cloud bursting scenarios? A couple of people. Any questions? Yep, go ahead. Correct. Cloud agnostic, yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Uh, um, okay. So I'm not sure, maybe I just don't get it, how, how it applies, right? I mean, basically, by your second 
second uh, option, right? You have actually made your cloud bench, at least for the first part, cloud unaware, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have actually in put a layer in between which basically hides what cloud you're on, right? Yeah, let me, let me repeat the question. So uh, um, I didn't get your name? Oh, Nick. Nick. So what Nick was saying is that uh, in this uh, particular uh, application, Cloud Bench, uh, we need all the applications to be aware of, their, uh, of where they're being deployed to be able to leverage uh, whatever is offer, uh, offered to them. Uh, but what Nick would like to is when he's building an, an application is not to have to care about uh, the implementation details and being able to specify at a high level uh, what he wants to, to uh, his application to to look like. Did I get that correction correct? Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is kind of, uh, kind of API is sort of something stored from the start, right? Like for me, the next one, mm -hmm. I will expect these APIs to be stored by the enterprise application, but while I've done my development in the lab, so it's basically an APS for the cloud. So I would not, the part that you see, spin up into the cloud and stuff, I would have a layer on the cloud and it would be there, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, re repeating once again, um, that the, um, the, a the application, he was saying that the application itself shouldn't be the one that's making the API calls. Uh, what should be making the API calls is the management layer. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, and that's kind of what, the, the, what our overall uh, assumption is here is that you want some middle tier whether that's a management layer or built into the application in our specific case, uh, you basically want to reduce the amount of effort it, it takes to, uh, to achieve affordability across those workloads. Did, does that answer your question? Which is what actually, yeah, that was the idea when we said that we wanted to delegate that responsibility is that in the end what we want to do is we want to have those volumes and we want to benchmark them. And we started off and went the old native way. We did, Coded every API, start improvising the disks, and then, well, that's exactly what you were saying. What happened to us is, we are, well, why are we doing it that way? Wouldn't it be simpler if, when those instances launch, everything happens on its own, and then the app starts, and everything's just working already? And that's exactly the, uh, the, the idea behind having that, adding that management layer, adding that delegation that's going to make that happen. Thanks for asking. Any further questions? Yes, gentlemen. The, the, uh, so, so the question is, what's the current state of uh, the cloud bench benchmarking application? Yeah. yeah. Um. Um, so so far we've uh, we are benchmarking all the public clouds out there, and we are now rolling it out to to help actual users of the cloud to benchmark their own private cloud. So for the public, we've got support for Rackspace, GC, and uh, EC2, and we're going to start with OpenStack for private clouds, taking what we've got from Rackspace and making that available on OpenStack. And now the thing you might ask is, why are we not delegating this to and removing all that code and rewriting it? The reason is we want to let people benchmark their apps without needing that layer, that delegation layer we added. So we'll add support for, Rackspay, uh, for OpenStack inside CloudBench itself. Checking, like, is the metadata API looking like Rackspay, looking at OpenStack and going up with it. Uh, Thomas, you want to show some of the results of those benchmarks, perhaps? Um, I don't think I'm logged in right now. So. Okay, not ready, okay. Um, any other questions? One more? So I am running an app on a hybrid cloud, specifically a big cloud Christmas thing, that I need Google Computer and Amazon Cloud provided for the running of that app. But the point is that this is a tool for Christmas Day. I'd rather run it in the same cloud and support it in French and see if I get a different benefit. For that type of app, where you're basically building something for So if I, uh, I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, so the question is, in the, uh, for the use case where you don't care about uh, the cloud's functionality and the only thing you care about is raw performance, uh, whether that management uh, layer actually helps or not. Is, is that what you're saying? Um, probably not. Um, again, the, the, this is a cloud abstraction layer, and if, if you 
if the application only cares about raw performance, then you're not going to benefit anything by having it uh, portable. So, um, um, that being said, uh, you can definitely run CloudBench and see for yourself what actually what cloud actually yields the best performance. Um, or if you're if you're using OpenStack, and I certainly hope you are. Uh, you can start playing around with different uh, storage backends and different things and benchmark each one of those um, to, to, to easily get uh, what configuration options yield the best, uh, the highest performance. One more. Um, so the uh, the question was, what happens in the future when, uh, for example, the EC2 uh, the EC2 layer uh, API layer on OpenStack is fully functional and oh I, I didn't get that right. So all uh, OpenStack compatible cloud API. Um, well, uh, so so the um, so I'll answer in two ways. One is um, abstraction layers generally just yield you more productivity. So uh, I don't see any problem in having an additional one if that yields productivity. Um, but for for this specific case, uh, the question was, what happens if you have decided to build a, a hybrid application that's going to span only identical uh, OpenStack clouds, correct? Ide uh, did I get that right on the identical parts? Uh, well, there's lots of different OpenStacks. Some of them might have Cinder, some of them might not have Cinder. Um, some of the, so, so that actually matters quite a bit. Yeah, so yeah, indeed, if you're going to be ap uh, building an application that spans a lot of uh, identical OpenStack clouds, then uh, the multi-cloud abstraction is not going to help you at all. No, yeah, there's one thing that I wanted to add is, the thing is that all the different clouds you're going to have, if you don't control of them, there's a good chance that, especially if they're public, they're going to try to differentiate by adding new tools, by adding a replacement for a certain component. And the risk is that if you don't have that abstraction layer, if one of them changes a the component, they sound like you either have to add an extra if clause in your code and that's gonna make everything ugly, or you're going to have to just stop using that one. And then what we think is that the abstraction layer is going to allow you to, this is where the decision is going to change. So all these apps you deployed, you're not going to, going to need to change all of them. And that kind of takes us back to what we're saying, why it's not scalable on the number of apps and the number of platforms, that if you have numerous, numerous apps, you can't really afford to take the risk of having to change all of them if just one of your providers decides to change one subsystem in the OpenStack cloud. That makes sense? Wallace? Not so much. Uh, perhaps that's what it's going to move towards. I would hope so, uh, but that's not what we're seeing right now. Where, with, if you're looking at, if you look at the Rackspace API, for example, uh, there's a lot of things that are just not in OpenStack itself. Um, I can imagine that if you're building an OpenStack cloud for your own private internal reasons, uh, your private internal uh, use, you're going to be deploying things differently, or perhaps on Cisco ECS or something like that. And, and, and sure, it's abstracted away via the API, but your performance might be different. And if your performance is different and you auto scale from one cloud to another, um, your load balancer, if it's going to be sending uh, traffic equally among all the different numbers of servers. If a certain class of server is just higher performance than the other, then you're gonna have poor load balancing between the two. So yes, ideally I could see there's a possibility that that sort of, that might happen. Um, I just don't see that to be very likely. Any last question? 
All right. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and we'll, we'll be uh, around if you have any uh, questions to ask us privately. Thank you very much. And thanks for coming to the Open Stack Summit.